Welcome, everyone, to the G-Note Podcast. I am your host, Jason Spicy G. Goldman, and I am a Grammy-winning record producer, arranger, and musician. I have been a music professor at USC for over 22 years, and I am most known for writing and producing music for the iconic Michael Buble over the past two decades. This is a podcast for musicians who want advice and strategies on navigating the music industry. If you're not a musician but a music fan, I promise there is plenty in here for you as well. On this podcast, we talk all things music. I'll be giving you tips and life lessons I've learned over my 30 years in the business, and I'll top it off with a dash of my humble opinion. On today's pod, everyone, we are talking about opportunities. Opportunities are always there, but you may have to find them. Let's go. All right, everyone, this is something that I really do truly believe and and really live by. When a door seems closed, you pry it open. If it still won't pry open, kick it down. I have been very fortunate to work with one of the greatest record producers on the planet. This man has worked with the top of the top, from working on Off the Wall and Thriller with Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones, to producing for icons like Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Chicago, Earth, Wind & Fire, and so many more. I'm talking about the legendary David Foster. For me, David Foster was a major catalyst in my career. Here's, Here's a bit of backstory on how I met David. I had just finished up my uh, master's degree at USC. At the same time, I was completing my advanced performance certificate at the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz. And Warner Brothers was looking to put together a band for one of David's new artists that he found named Michael Buble. They had just released Buble's first album and they needed to get him on the road and touring as soon as possible. So they were looking for some young stud musicians (laughs) and uh, WBR, Warner Brothers Records, had reached out to my alma mater, Berklee College of Music and USC and actually the Monk Institute. And luckily, they all had recommended me for this audition. Uh, Pretty, pretty awesome, actually, that I left uh, at least somewhat of an impression on them. So I go down to SIR in uh, Hollywood. For those that don't know, SIR is short for Studio Instrument Rentals. Basically, they rent out gear and rehearsal spaces. So lots of acts who are preparing for tours do their music rehearsals there before they even uh, get on the road. My main instrument uh, is saxophone. So when I went in there, it's pretty much me and my saxophone at the audition. So I go down to uh, SIR and walk into a big room and it was me, David Foster, and Michael Buble. I literally, at that time, had no idea what they were going to ask me to do, nor did I even know who David Foster was until after the audition. I didn't really start studying music producers, like figuring out who was producing what until later on in my career. So I really didn't know. Um, and, And if I did, I probably would have been super nervous because he's... He can be kind of intimidating. So I went in and they first asked me to sight read a piece, which was fantastic for me because I was known for being a really good sight reader. After we read the piece, they asked me to take a solo on a standard called The Way You Look Tonight, which is actually the, the, one of the tunes that's on the, his first record. David was playing piano and I played a solo and they seemed to really dig what I played. The next day I got the call and they asked if I wanted to join the band. Initially, the only people who were hired for the band were me on saxophone and my two friends, uh, Alan Chang on piano, who ends up becoming the music director of the band, and Nick Vianus, uh, a, a, a friend of mine from Berkeley College of Music, um, who had moved out to LA. And so we were the three people that were originally in the band. David had called and asked me if I could recommend some people for the rest of the band, So, of course, I recommended all my friends who were fantastic musicians. As a side note, one of the best parts about being a musician is that you have a lot of musician friends, of course, and we then hire each other for gigs and we, you know, we create this little network. 
which is what kind of makes taking less pay, <laughs> when you think about it, tolerable, I, I guess. All right, so moving on, the band was made up of four horns, two trumpets, me on sax, and Nick on trombone, uh, guitar, piano, bass, and drums. And we were gearing up for a week's worth of rehearsals to prep for a long weekend of shows at this club called the Cinegrill, which was um, Michael Feinstein's new place at the time. Uh, He had opened it at the historic Roosevelt Hotel down in uh, Hollywood. So when we first got to rehearsal, we were handed basically all of the music from the first album. Moondance, That's All, Kissing a Fool, like all those songs. And keep in mind, on the album, the music is written for full orchestra and big band. We're talking about songs that sometimes had upwards of 40 musicians on them. And remember, we're just four horns and uh, four rhythm section players. So we start playing the music and it sounds fine, but very bland. And I can hear David talking in the back of the club about it not sounding right and Buble saying something is missing. So I raised my hand and I said, I think it's missing harmony in the horn parts. Because we were only four horns when there was normally 13, like in a standard big band, we were handed all the lead parts in each section, which many times tend to be the same note. So hence why there was no harmony. I said the horns needed to be orchestrated for this instrumentation. And David said, look, we just don't have time for that. We're just going to have to go with what we have. An opportunity is what I saw. After rehearsal that day, I went home and I spent the evening orchestrating one of the tunes. I think it was Moondance. I I can't remember which one exactly. Exactly. But I spent, you know, it was probably a good three, three, four hours just orchestrating the tune out um, for the horns. Mostly it's the horns. The rhythm section parts could stay the same. So the next day we come in and we're about to start. And I said, hey, I arranged Moondance. Do you, do you want to hear it? And David seemed surprised and didn't even say anything at first, but seemed interested. He said, okay, let's hear it. We played through the chart and he said, wow, that was so much better. And Buble's there nodding his head also like, yeah, that was way better. So I told, I told David, I said, look, I'd be down to orchestrate the rest of the horn parts for, you know, for all the songs that we have. And he said with this kind of arrogant foster tone, you're really going to arrange all these songs in two days? And I said, yes. And then he just basically ignored what I said and just kept rehearsing that day. I went home that evening and basically didn't sleep much for the next day or two, but I got all, I think it was like 10 songs done in two days. But I want to pause here for a second because this is especially for you musicians who are entering that kind of tough part of your career where you have to start trying to make a living. I went home and did the first chart without any expectation. Of getting paid. Sure, I, I did know there would be a possibility if they liked the music that they would offer to pay me or potentially pay me in the future. But the main goal here was me showing off to one of the greatest producers and this new artist what I could do. I was thinking bigger picture, the long game, not the short one. And this is where a lot of young musicians fall short. I believe I ended up orchestrating, again, something like 10 songs for the horns for the show. And it it, it ended up being super successful. Um, And this was the beginning of the Buble band. And this was a, a, my first small success in getting David to know my writing and know who I was. For those of you that have never heard of David Foster or any stories about David, Um, I recommend that you watch the Netflix documentary on him. I think it's called, I think it's off the record, David Foster off the record. This is actually one of the best documentaries I have ever watched, mostly because I feel it is very, it's, it's a very accurate representation of David. A lot of documentaries tend to leave out the bad stuff, but this one doesn't hold anything back. And what you see on the screen is actually David, you know, it's, Obviously, it's a little different for me because I've been able to witness him live and I know who he is. So 
it's a little different, but I can tell you honestly, it, it is David. So the moral of today's pod, everyone, is that opportunities are not always front and center. They aren't always as straightforward as, hey, is there anyone in the band who can orchestrate the music for the horns because it's missing harmony? Many times it's finding the opportunities, finding the small holes, creating the opportunities, paying attention, and then having the confidence to know you can do the job better than anyone. Because everyone knows you only get one chance at a first impression. And sometimes that impression can be the one that makes or breaks you. All right, everyone, that's all the time we have for today's pod. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this pod so you can stay up to date with new shows, giveaways, and more importantly, concerts. I need to see you cats at the shows. That's where it's super fun and you get to see me in in my element and you get to see the band and, and have a great time. You can also follow me on Instagram at Spicy G Music or check out my website, jasongoldmanmusic.com to see what projects I'm currently working on and to see when I'll be performing next. Thanks everyone for listening. Much love everyone. Peace. Peace.